Live from NBC4, this is the Channel 4 News at 5. God has done some incredible miracles. I've got some, uh, some great friends, and more importantly, I've got some incredible lawyers who put it all on the line for me. Former them. Orange County Sheriff Mike Corona reacting to the verdict in his trial. A jury today acquitting him of a sweeping corruption conspiracy and convicting him on only one count. Good evening, everyone. I'm Colleen Williams. And I'm Paul Moyer. We'll get to that story of the surprising verdict involving Mike Corona. But first tonight on this Friday night, we begin with breaking news. It comes to us out of Long Beach. The FBI is on board a Carnival cruise ship that apparently returned from a cruise with two people missing. Stu Mundell. Live over the port of Long Beach Harbor, the News Chopper 4. Stu, what can you tell us? Well, that's right, Paul. We are over the Long Beach Harbor, and we're looking at that Carnival cruise ship that you talked about. That's named the Paradise. Now, you did return here earlier this afternoon with two of its passengers missing. The FBI has boarded the ship and are searching that couple's cabin at this time. What we do know about the missing couple is that it's an elderly couple. He is 90 years old. She is 79 years old, and they have not been seen on the boat since Tuesday. Now, obviously, the ship just returned here, and they have did un they did unload some people, and they are reloading some people right now. The FBI is still on board. They are in that cabin searching for clues to what it might have happened to that elderly couple. Live from News Chopper 4, I'm Stu Mandel. Paul, Colleen, back to you in the studio. All right, Stu, now to former Sheriff Mike Corona. Tonight, he is a convicted felon. He was found guilty on one count of witness tampering, but the jurors rejected the government's contention that uh, Corona used his office to enrich himself and others. NBC4's Vicki Vargas live in Santa Ana right now with more on what happened today. Vicki. And Colleen, some of those jurors felt that their hands were legally tied, that they could not convict on the other six charges because of timing. Jurors said they followed the law and could not find that the man once dubbed America's sheriff had conspired to use his office for personal gain. A lot of things that I need to apologize for in my life. And uh, I'm uh, a man that's got a lot of, uh, has made some mistakes along the way, uh, like a number of people who walk the face of the earth. Mike Corona listened as the verdicts were read count by count, not guilty on conspiracy, not guilty on mail fraud three times over. With that, he began to weep. Then he collapsed on the defense table. Prosecutors charged the former sheriff with accepting bribes for favors. Their star witness was former assistant sheriff Don Heidel, who testified he paid Corona $1,000 a month in cash, gave him a boat, and treated his wife to expensive clothes. But he was well rehearsed, um, and uh, we, we, you know, took that into account when we when we weighed the evidence. The jury did believe what they heard from an undercover tape recorded at this restaurant, that Corona, conspiracy or not, was trying to get Heidel to lie to a federal grand jury. Uh, don't on that, God, he was convicted. I use this Don Heidel phrase on an ongoing basis. Man. It's like, you know, all shit surrounds me. I mean, it's, it literally is. Jerome, the only African-American on the jury, said Corona apologized after the verdict. Mike Corona did something. His hand was in the cookie jar. He was just smart enough to wipe his hand clean. That's my personal feeling. Jurors said the evidence showed even if Corona broke the law, the statutes of limitations we, made them yeah, too we'll old to prosecute. We didn't uh, bring the case soon enough is what that means, but... Given the witness tampering and whatnot, that affected the ability of the agents to uncover the facts uh, sooner. So we brought the case as soon as it could have been brought. Are you concerned about any prison time? Yeah, you know, I, um, I'll leave that up to my uh, my attorneys. There, you've heard uh, Jeff, who's very articulate. They're looking at the okay, appeal no. process. Um, no disrespect to the jury; they, they spent a lot of time on it. But we'll see what happens on, on that side of it. And so Corona's attorneys say they will appeal this single conviction, a conviction which does carry a maximum of 20 years in prison. Live in Santa Ana, I'm Vicki Vargas, Channel 4 News. All right, Vicki, as we said, it really was a surprise to a lot of people. The prosecution really thought they had an airtight case, what with all the witness testimony. And as Vicki alluded to, the secret undercover audio tape with Mike Corona's voice on it. So many people in Orange County who followed the Corona corruption trial said they were really surprised by the verdicts handed down by the jury today. NBC4's Doug Kriegel, live in Santa Ana with that part of our story tonight. Doug. Indeed, Paul. Many people here regarded Mike Corona as sort of a celebrity sheriff. And of course, after the Samantha Runyon murder case was solved, Corona became arguably 
the most famous sheriff in America. He had aspirations for higher office, like lieutenant governor. Not anymore. All over Orange County, sheriff's deputies are declining to comment on the verdicts in the Mike Corona trial. Outside the jail and courthouse, many people said they were genuinely surprised. It makes me very upset because he, you know, there's a lot of crime and what was done to really enforce the law with him. Everything that he evidently did, he deserves to do hard time. Like, you know, any normal person here on the street, if they were, had done everything he had done in office, they would be doing life. The current Orange County Sheriff issued a statement saying the department is relieved the trial has concluded. She said those charges served as a distraction. Meantime, out on Broadway in Santa Ana, other opinions. I just thought that he would be found guilty. Uh, why? Um, I don't know, that's just what I felt. From everything I heard in the newspapers, it was pretty, uh, pretty bad accusations. But again, you know, he was found innocent by a jury of his peers. So that's what matters at the end of the day. Courthouse observers criticized the prosecution for not calling former Sheriff George Hamarillo as a witness. Now the question here is, will Mike Corona have to go to jail on that one guilty count? Live in Santa Ana, Doug Kriegel, Channel 4 News. Now the latest on another story we've been following. Officials in Orange County say a tip led them to Abrea landfill where they resumed the search today for a missing woman. A team of about 50 investigators were back at the landfill there this morning. They are looking for 82-year-old Sarah Maori, who last spoke to her son on Monday. The next day, she vanished from this assisted living home in Laguna Niguel. She left behind her walker, her hearing aid, her purse, and medication she needs. Investigators would not elaborate on the source or the nature of the tip, but they are also going over a truck they say may be connected to her disappearance. The driver is a friend of Maori's grandson, he is being held now on a parole violation. Colleen, now on to U.S. Air Flight 1549 that will always be known now as the miracle on the Hudson. Police divers spent all day today stabilizing the U.S. Airways jet that made that amazing, incredible emergency landing in New York Hudson River yesterday. And amazingly, all 155 people on board the airplane survived without serious injuries. And tonight, some of those passengers are recounting the harrowing moments right before the impact. Reporter Michelle Franzen is live in Lower Manhattan tonight for us with the latest. Michelle. Well, good evening, Paul. Here's where the investigation stands at this hour. The NTSB says that uh, they are, are indeed searching for both engines of that aircraft, not in intact as the plane is here. It sits here at the lower pier, uh, lower pier here in Lower Manhattan. In the meantime, we're also hearing some amazing stories, and we're also finding out exactly what went right when the plane went down. The crippled jetliner that plunged into the Hudson River is now tied off at a pier in Lower Manhattan. With each person rescued from the wreckage of the U.S. Air jetliner, there are also incredible stories emerging, both of courage and fear in the moments before the plane went down. Usually in moments like that, you yeah. would expect chaos. Yeah. It got real quiet. Yeah. 20,000 ton aircraft floating in the water and people didn't die. That's, yeah, that's nothing short of a miracle. Uh, just saying, you know, I love you. But it was it scribbled it as fast as I could uh, because the, the, the seconds were going by so quickly. Final thoughts, passenger Eric Stevenson wanted his family to know in case he didn't survive. Pilot Chesley Solenberger, a veteran commercial pilot and former Air Force fighter pilot, is credited for saving lives when the plane came down. Girls. His wife in California says her husband and father of two was just doing his job. We are very grateful that everyone is off the airplane safely. And that was really what my husband asked to convey to everyone. The miraculous outcome was also helped by the quick response of New York's fire, police and ferry boat crews who helped bring the freezing passengers to safety. A lot of them were just, you know, in shock. They were thankful that we were there. They were scared, you know. Shivering. Today at a city hall ceremony, Mayor Michael Bloomberg commended crews and pilot Chesley Solenberger for their heroism. And he offered the entire crew of the U.S. Airways flight a key to the city. Before that happens, all will have to be interviewed by NTSB investigators. In this accident, there were some things that went wrong, but there was so much that went right. 
Preliminary reports from the pilot and passengers point to the plane hitting several birds and knocking out both engines just after takeoff. Investigators will retrieve the plane's black boxes said to be still intact on the aircraft. And back here tonight, live large cranes have been brought in to help hoist the plane out of the water and onto a barge as early as tomorrow. In the meantime, workers are working at this hour trying to rig that aircraft and to stabilize it further. Colleen. All right, Michelle, reporting live for us from New York City. Thank you. Today, nearly 2,000 people packed a San Dimas church for the funeral of nine family members killed during a Christmas Eve party. Dressed as Santa Claus, Bruce Pardo killed his ex-wife, her parents, Joseph and Alicia Ortega, and six other relatives before taking his own life. Today, the crowd of mourners heard stories about each victim. Friends remembered the Ortega family as being large, close, and fun-loving. I had so much fun with them. Gamble, drink. But they were just the greatest people in the world. Very, very beautiful people. Hard-working people. The holiday massacre left 15 children in the Ortega family without one or both of their parents. All right, turning now to the budget standoff known as California. It is hard to believe that California's cash crisis could get worse, but today it did. We've known for a while, a long time, the state runs out of money on February the 1st. But today, State Controller John Chung announced that California will not be sending any checks to more than a million elderly, blind, and disabled people who depend on state money for rent and groceries. State tax refunds will also be delayed. Taxpayers who expected to use their refund to purchase a car, to make food payments, to pay off their credit card bills, will have to wait. The deficit clock outside Governor Schwarzenegger's office shows the state is right now, at this moment, more than $8 billion in the rent. Still ahead here on the Channel 4 News at 5, the countdown to the presidential inauguration. Well, he was talking about rain. Let's see if he still is. Here's Fritz. Well, Paul, the fire danger continues, but we may as well relax and enjoy a guilt-free, beautiful weekend because we have a chance of rain on the way. All that in my full forecast when we return. Don't go away. Back right now to our top story. FBI agents on board a cruise ship that just docked in Long Beach trying to figure out what happened to a missing couple, an elderly couple. NBC4's Beverly White live on the scene with the latest for us. Beverly. Well, Colleen, behind us here in Long Beach, you can see the Carnival Cruise Line, the Paradise. There are people on board this ship, some of whom we spoke with as we drove in. They seem to believe that they're departing at 530, but that may not be the case based on the FBI investigation you referenced a short time ago and the chopper talked about at the top of the hour. We understand it's an elderly couple they are seeking on the inside of this ship. Their stateroom was found to be empty when the ship arrived here in Long Beach this afternoon, and the evidence team from the FBI searched the room, but the couple has not been accounted for. We're learning here on the ground from sources that the couple may be a suicide. We understand the room was locked from the inside and a bottle of wine was found and also a do not disturb sign on their door. They haven't been seen on board, according to this source, since Tuesday, forgive me, Wednesday of this week. And again, the discovery this afternoon upon arrival in Long Beach that the couple could not be found. The husband, 90 years old, the woman, 79, their names have not been revealed and the FBI has yet to tell us more about their investigation, only that the team was on the ship this afternoon and the couple has yet to be found. So again, we're talking about the Paradise, which is one of the Carnival cruise lines that departs here for three and four day trips to Mexico, which was believed to be the case in this situation, that the couple was on board for an excursion with hundreds of others and now hundreds of others are back, but the couple cannot be found. The investigation continues. As we learn more, we will share it with you. Reporting live in Long Beach, I'm Beverly White. Back to you in the studio. All right, Beverly, we thank you for the new information. Appreciate it. The inauguration takes place in just four days, but President-elect Barack Obama is not waiting until he is sworn in. Today, he took a presidential-style trip to the state of Ohio. And Mr. Obama made a pitch for his massive economic stimulus plan at a factory in Ohio. The $825 billion proposal was unveiled yesterday by House Democrats. The president-elect says his proposal would make smart investments in the country's future and would create solid jobs in up-and-coming industries. But on the other side, the critics are saying the spending is excessive and there are too few tax cuts involved. In the meantime, a Cypress Park teenager tonight preparing to take part in history on Tuesday. She is Jacqueline Mendoza. She is 13 years old. She will see firsthand the swearing in 
of President-elect Barack Obama. And as NBC4's Kim Baldonado tells us tonight, Mendoza was invited to attend a congressional youth conference centered around the inauguration. With a shy smile and a grateful heart, Jacqueline Mendoza stood before her classmates as they wished her well on the eve of her trip to Washington, where she'll attend the inauguration. Like the whole school has been so supportive and and they make me feel really, really special. The eighth grader from Nightingale Middle School will join other students from across the country for a five day educational experience, which includes tickets to the inauguration and an inaugural ball. Her father, a tailor by trade, made her dress for the ball. Something truly amazing. Even right now, I'm, I still can't believe that it's actually gonna happen because I'm just, I'm in shock that I'm, that I am able to go. The daughter of Mexican immigrants who did not have the opportunity to finish high school, Mendoza excels academically and is captain of the Science Bowl team. She's been honored by the city of Los Angeles and is the pride of her school, her family, and Cypress Park community members. She's my culture. Second, that she is a child, you know, who wants to do so good and her parents have had no education have done something good for her. The principal had an important message for the rest of the student body. He said Jacqueline's success represents their opportunities. You too will encounter opportunities, but you must work for them so when they arrive at your front door, you're ready. It's a lesson this 13-year-old has already learned, and it has landed her a front row seat to witness history. In Cypress Park, Kim Baldonado, Channel 4 News. Be nice if we could follow her while she is in Washington next week. Well, you know what? Maybe we it's can. It's a thought, guys. It's a thought. <laughs> All right, Fritz is here with more on the uh, weather for the weekend. And how's that R word working for you, Fritz? Well, I'll tell you, what, we've upped our chances from 10 to 20. So, uh, you know, the closer we get, the more certain we are about the forecast. But still, the red flag warning in effect until tomorrow. And here's why. Look at the dry air in some of these communities. Anaheim Hills right now 71, but 16% relative humidity. Laverne, 17%. 18% at Laguna Beach. Offshore winds taking the dry air all the way down to the water. Let's get a look now at a satellite map, and we see a, a harbinger of change off in the Pacific, and that is the marine layer clouds trying to return, and they will gradually by the middle or latter part of next week. Offshore flow, however, continues right through the weekend. Dry, warm air. Red flag alert till 8 o'clock tomorrow. High surf advisory, Ventura, L.A., and Orange County coast. This is a west swell, five to seven foot breakers, occasional sets eight to ten. Cooler days down to almost normal or slightly above by Tuesday. And again, the slight chance of rain. The window is Wednesday through Friday, and right now we'll call it a 10 to 20 percent chance. It won't be a big deal even if it does show up. It'll be a light rain event. Overnight tonight, upper 40s to low 50s. 58 Oxnard, 26 up in Lancaster. Highs tomorrow, inland valleys coming down below 80. Mid to upper 70s, maybe 80 at Riverside. 81 in the low desert, 54 in the San Bernardino mountain range. Still 80 plus, no change. From the east San Fernando Valley to downtown to the San Gabriel Valley, 81 degrees there, 78 inland Orange County. And no change for inland Ventura County. See me at Thousand Oaks, 81 Woodland Hills, that same number, and 73 at Santa Clarita and still Santa Ana breezes in the Santa Clarita Valley. Here's the Mathis Brothers seven day outlook for LA, Ventura, and Orange counties. A spectacular weekend. And you can just enjoy it because the fire danger will ultimately go away. And we have a chance of moisture, and that's all we need to sort of reverse this almost two-week period of very, very dry weather. And that, again, will happen Wednesday through Friday. It's a 10 to 20 percent chance, and it probably will not warrant a forecast of much measurable rain, maybe a couple of tenths. Inland Empire, the mountains go from the 50s down to the 40s. The low desert goes from the low 80s down to the low 70s once we get that trough in here to replace the dry, high-pressure area we've had, and the valleys will maybe bump up a degree or two on Monday, but then that'll be a head fake because we'll be back down in the <laughs> 60s by the end of the week. So we're getting slightly more certain that at least somebody's going to get a little rain next week, and that's an awesome, well, you awesome thing. You bumped up to 20% percent better yeah, than 10. Yeah, that's pretty good. We're really going out on a limb here. <laughs> yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Enjoy the weekend. Worry about you the rain too, later. Sir. Thanks, sir. Next on the Channel 4 News coming up here at 5, a miracle gel. Dr. Bruce Hensel shows us the medical concoction that could treat aneurysms and much more. Coming up at six, bird strikes are a danger at every airport, including LAX. See what's being done to keep passengers safe. Plus, think you're paying too much for unlimited cell phone texting and internet? Well, how does 50 bucks for everything sound? Who's making this offer? Find out next at six. Brain aneurysms kill thousands of people every year. Now scientists are investigating a super gel which may prevent them from killing you. Dr. Bruce Hensel has more. 
Now this research student is mixing up a fix for brain aneurysms. It's almost like your salad dressing where you mix it up, uh, the Italian salad dressings where you mix it up and you get an emulsion. Dr. Brent Vernon is referring to a polymer gel his team is testing to prevent aneurysms from bursting. They're actually uh, new materials that we're developing that uh, go from being a liquid uh, before you introduce them into the body to being a solid after you introduce them in the body. It's this delicate balance that Vernon has worked years to perfect. Once this is a gel inside the aneurysm, this can uh, stop the pressure from acting on the wall of the aneurysm, but rather on our material uh, and keep it from rupturing. It wasn't an easy task. Many different formulas were tested. One of the biggest challenges was to develop materials that, uh, even though they were carried in water, would still remain unswollen and strong after they set up in the aneurysm. The gel will be very useful for aneurysms that cannot be removed in surgery. If it's in somewhere in the brain, somewhere you don't want to, to be cutting or getting to, it actually can be a permanent uh, solution. Vernon sees a number of other uses for the gel, including reversible contraception and even delivering medicines into the body. One of the applications could be if you want to plug a blood vessel that feeds a tumor, then you can put anti-cancer drugs in it. The idea is to get the gel in through a tube without major surgery, which means maybe life saved with less danger. If the trials go well, Vernon says he'll apply for FDA approval in the next two to three years. I'm Dr. Bruce Hensel. When we come back on this Friday night, a suspect under arrest in the case of a four-year-old boy gunned down in Echo Park. It's new at 5.30 how the victim's neighbors helped lead police to the accused gunman. Tonight at 11, it's America's biggest bash ever, and the inauguration is drawing millions, including a who's who of top recording artists. From the ritzy balls to the rockin' parties, from rap to rock to jazz to orchestras, the lineup tonight on the Channel 4 News at 11. Sunday, Open House goes on the hunt for a perfect home for newlyweds looking to start a family. Then, green tips to cleaning your home while saving the planet. Sunday at 4.30, and always on LXTV.com. The shooting death of a four-year-old boy in Echo Park. Police say he was hit with a stray bullet. And tonight, an alleged gang member is under arrest. Hello once again, everybody. I'm Paul Moyer. And I'm Colleen Williams. This shooting happened during a confrontation between suspected gang members. And the LAPD says it threw everything into this investigation. And it says more arrests are, in fact, expected. We get the latest right now from NBC4's Angie Crouch. The family of a four-year-old boy shot and killed by a stray bullet in Echo Park Tuesday is relieved police have arrested a suspect, but they say they're leaving the rest in God's hands. This morning, L.A. police announced they arrested 25-year-old Howard Astorga from Boyle Heights following tips from the community. He admitted to us of being present at that, on top of that hill at the time the shooting occurred. Police won't release Astorga's mugshot, but say he's a gang member known to hang out on West Court Street where the shooting happened and has been in and out of custody since he was 10 years old. Investigators believe little Roberto Lopez Jr. was killed while standing on the sidewalk when Astorga allegedly fired up to seven shots at a passing car after someone on the street accused the driver of speeding. The family and the community have been calling for justice. Police and city leaders promised to deliver. The father was still... In such grief, he was wailing, yelling for his son, screaming for his life, and asking, the mom was asking, just get the person who did this. Don't let my son die in vain. Police are still questioning witnesses in the neighborhood, and they're still looking for the weapon. We're going out to the community again, asking them for their support, and trying to recover uh, any firearms that may, be, that may have been uh, dropped in that neighborhood. As the memorial here in the community continues to build, Howard Astorga remains behind bars on $1 million bail, pending his court hearing on Tuesday. In Echo Park, Angie Crouch, Channel 4 News. Police tonight announced the arrest of a second suspect in connection with the death of a man from the city of Orange. They say the victim was lured to a motel where he was stabbed to death. Las Vegas police arrested 42-year-old Leticia Carrasco Ornelas last night on suspicion of murder and robbery. Her 22-year-old son, Noel Carrasco, was also arrested earlier this week in Las Vegas. Investigators say on December 22nd, Ornelas lured 42-year-old Matias Vasquez from a bar in Stanton 
to a motel room in Buena Park, where her son was waiting. He allegedly later robbed and killed him. Investigators say they may have found the victim's body earlier today near a freeway off-ramp not far from Barstow. The body still has not been positively ID'd. Sheriff's detectives in Riverside tonight say a sting operation similar to the Dateline NBC to catch a predator series that has ended with the arrest of a man on child pornography charges. 35-year-old Louis Medina of Santa Ana traveled to the city of Norco to meet with undercover officers following a complaint by a 17-year-old girl who said she had been sexually exploited and used in pornographic videos made by Medina. At the meeting in Norco, Police say he brought along his one and his five-year-old daughters. The young girls were taken into protective custody, eventually released to their mother. So you say you want to buy a mansion? This could be your lucky weekend. More than 2,000 foreclosed L.A. homes are hitting the auction block this weekend. Some described as stunning mansions. The auction begins tomorrow at the L.A. Convention Center. The event is open to the public with no entry fee at all. 2008 was a record year for the foreclosure auction industry with more than $3 billion worth of homes being sold, just like that one. They are stunning. All right, 60 years ago today, Channel 4 signed on the air at our original location on Sunset and Vine. Mm -hmm. Since then, we have been privileged to experience the stories and images that have shaped Southern California and the nation with you. Tonight, we share that history with you. This is KNBH, Channel 4. January 16th, 1949. Life is good. KNBH, which later became KNBC, transmitted its first images from a tower high atop Mount Wilson. The Pickard family was the top attraction. Less than four months on the air, KNBH launched its first newscast. Flames raced through the grandstand of the beautiful Hollywood Park racetrack in Inglewood last night. An impressive list of journalists began working here. It's a legacy that continues today. It was a star-studded place, and we had our stars on the news set, too. We had Jess Marlowe anchoring the five. Wanted in the slaying of Dr. Martin Luther King is actually being James Earl Ray. Then Tom Snyder on the sixth. To all of you who wired and called and wrote. Tom Brokaw on the 11th. Good evening. I'm Tom Brokaw. Brian Gumbel was doing the sports. In baseball, the name of the game is winning. Pat Sajak was doing the weather. Well, we didn't get any shower activity of any significance today. I had to pinch myself to see that I wasn't dreaming. It was pretty heady company to be to be around. People kept pouring into KNBC because it was the place to be. We used to look at tapes of KNBC. That was where we all wanted to be, but it would never be possible. You could dream. For every journalist who's walked the halls of KNBC, so has the responsibility to cover the biggest stories of our time. I want to make it clear that I'm a... I think queer television is at its best to be able to tell those stories about major events that happen in our community. You have to remember that they're relying on you and they really believe that you're telling them the truth. So you better be doing that. When I first started doing this, we were using film. There was no live camera crew. We used to run out, we'd shoot things on film, and we'd have to race it back on a motorcycle. It's laughable of how we used to get on the air. And now we're digital. Channel 4 has multiple ways to communicate with you immediately, like traditional Channel 4, our NBC LA website, and digital channel News Raw. Hi everyone, Macalo Medina with you here on Digital 4.2. A lot of the breaking news stories we see, we see people taking out their cell phones, taking pictures and emailing them to us. Television brings people together. There'll be nothing to replace that. Join us tonight at 7 p.m. for an hour-long special, our 60th anniversary celebration. We'll see a lot more of what we just saw there, yeah, won't absolutely. we? Absolutely. Look back at some of the most memorable moments, top stories, familiar faces, a lot of familiar faces, tonight at 7 p.m. It's appointment TV. Must see TV. Well, a lot of great, a lot of great names and a lot of great moments from the 1970s mm -hmm. when I started. You remember the 1970s, don't you? 
<laughs> don't ask me that, Paul. You don't want me to go there. But all it right. was so, it, you know what? We have to tell you, it, it's a great program. And getting all those people to sit still for that, I mean, you know, Marlo and Kelly Lang, I mean, you know, people that, that uh, from way oh, back yeah. that we love and we remember so, so well. Brokaw, Gumbel. Yeah. They went on Linda the bigger Alvarez. and better things. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we stayed here, but that's okay. That's just fine because what did I say the other day? We love L.A. That's why we stayed. Love it a lot. All right, sports is up next. Here's Mario. You're also going to have to watch this. Tiger Woods receives a special invitation from Barack Obama. Plus, the Lakers share their thoughts on Obama's basketball skills. This is Peter's first day as host of the Surprise Patrol. Yes. You have won yeah. $10 million! <laughs> I quit my stinking job! Yeah. But he never thought it would end like this. Peter, we have a problem. We are at the wrong home. Okay. Oops. Howie Mandel puts real people in unreal situations. That guy that was talking in your ear? That was you! Oh, yeah. Howie Do It premieres tonight, 8, 7 Central on NBC. All right, Mario's got the sports for Friday night, leading off tonight with a little Tiger time. Mario. You got it, Paul. Thanks. Tiger Woods, among the world's most famous athletes, has always shied away from politics and seldom gets involved in any political festivities. But even Tiger couldn't say no when he was approached about speaking Sunday at the We Are One concert at the Lincoln Memorial. It's one of many celebrations leading up to Barack Obama's inauguration next Tuesday. Tiger said it was an honor to be invited to the event, which will feature performances by Beyonce, Stevie Wonder, Garth Brooks, and U2. Speaking of the president-elect, his love for basketball is well known. In fact, during the campaign trail, he was often seen playing and even hooped it up with players from the University of North Carolina. In fact, Mr. Obama plans to take out the bowling alley in the White House and put in a basketball court. Knowing that, we decided to ask the Lakers what they think of his game and if they plan to watch the inauguration. He's a lefty, so he probably can shoot it pretty good, you know what I mean? I don't know what time practice is going to be on Tuesday. Uh, or I might have to come up with some sniffles or uh, a little bit of a cough so I can stay home and watch now the inauguration. <laughs> now, are you going to be uh, watching the inauguration? Uh, I, don't, I don't think I will. When is, when is it, tomorrow? On uh, Tuesday. On Tuesday? I don't think I will. Uh, I think I'll, uh, what I'll do? I think I'll go to the movies or something. Yeah, you know, do something you know, just away from, from basketball and, and away from politics. I'm not a big in, in politics. All right, how about this? Newcastle striker Shola Amiobi of the British Premier League recently returned to his house and found it in such disarray he thought it had been broken into. His clothes were scattered everywhere. His checkbook was missing. In a panic, he called police and gave them a complete list of what was taken. The only problem is nothing was taken. It turns out Shola forgot he had put away those items after a party that left his house so messy it just appeared like a burglary. Now that's one wild party. And check this out, that's San Diego Mayor Jerry Sanders wearing a Steelers jersey and holding a terrible towel, his payment for losing a bet to Pittsburgh Mayor Luke Ravenstahl after Pittsburgh beat the Chargers last weekend in the playoffs. If you're wondering why the Penguins, well, part of the deal was to pose for pictures in the Penguin Encounter exhibit at SeaWorld since compared to the Steel City, that's probably the coldest place in San Diego. The NFL playoffs have certainly gone to the birds, especially with the Cardinals, Ravens, and Eagles still alive. As a matter of fact, the Steelers are the only non-avian mascot among the final four teams. The NFC title game between Arizona and Philadelphia will be played on Sunday, followed by the AFC title game in Pittsburgh. And finally, the Florida Marlins are once again looking for some footloose and fancy-free men of girth. The team is holding tryouts for the second season of the Marlins Manatees, an all-male plus-size cheerleading squad. Real manatees are known for their large dimensions, so the Marlins want their manatees to have the same dimensions but be decidedly more agile. The group will dance between innings at all home games on Friday and Saturday nights. Not much to say except shake that booty. All right, if I'm at a Marlins game, I know where I'm going between innings. Maybe get some food. Guys, that's it. Back to you. <laughs> yeah. Lots to look at. All right. All right. Still ahead here tonight, how a new project might help save the environment and the economy at the same time. And on this Friday night, beautiful shot looking live over the San Fernando Valley. Will the heat last through the weekend? Could be beautiful. Fritz next with a forecast. There is a new green project that is not only looking at ways to develop sustainable energy and reduce carbon emissions. It could also boost our struggling economy. NBC4's Pablo Pereira has more. If the United States economy is to recover, it will need an energy boost. 
That's what some of the Silicon Valley's movers and shakers say. And they're putting their money where their ideals are, to the tune of $100 million, launching a new research institute at Stanford University to focus on global energy. A new technology that meets the China price, that you can sell to China as an alternative for burning coal. That's the, that's the holy grail in this, and that's the kind of problem we want to focus on. The money will go towards energy solutions at Stanford, a big catalyst for the economy, according to both the White House and Silicon Valley leaders. We have a very natural linkage right now with, with most of the high-tech companies throughout the valley. Jim Sweeney is the director of the Precord Center for Energy Efficiency. It will be very natural for research, lead to licensing, lead to technology um, um, that will spread throughout not just the valley in the United States, but the world. Some of the technology is already in place for a green rally. Now the money is in place for research to take this kind of technology to the next level. Pablo Pereira, Channel 4 News. All right, Fritz is back with a quick look at our weather for the weekend. Fritz. Okay, Colleen, well, we can't let our guard down now. The red flag warning continues for L.A. and Ventura County until 8 o'clock tomorrow night. But a slow change in patterns, a slow return to normal temperatures, a slow reintroducing moisture into our skies, and a slow letting down of the fire danger. And then the payoff would be a little rain if we could do it. Again, that window of opportunity for rain is Wednesday to Friday. We'll call it a 10 to 20 percent chance. Not a lot of measurable rain. Along the coast over the weekend, spectacular. Spectacular weekend at the beaches, no marine layer, lots of sunshine, very comfortable temperatures at or slightly below 80, low 80s downtown, upper 70s to low 80s in the warmer inland valleys, and uh, they will ebb a little bit and uh, maybe bounce back up again before we're through, before we cool back down to close to or slightly above normals. In the mountains, we're going from the 50s to the low 40s at the end of the cooling trend on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The inland valleys will go from the upper 70s to 80 down to the 60s, and the 80s in the deserts down to the low 70s. Again, slightly more normal circumstances. Again, we have increased west swell, L.A. and Ventura and Orange County beaches, five to seven foot breakers, some sets eight to 10, maybe some minor coastal overflow. That'll go Saturday through Monday. Full forecast at 6. Have a great weekend. We'll see you then. Enjoy, sir. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you at 6 o'clock. In the meantime, next, a sign of the times. Find out why the House doesn't always win in Las Vegas. Well, apparently making a profit in Nevada is no longer a sure bet. A new report out today shows a huge drop in casino profits in 2008. The annual Gaming Abstract reports shows the net income of Nevada's major hotel casinos was about $721 million last year. That was just a third of the money made in the year 2007. The reports say big casinos faced millions of dollars in bad debt expenses, plus gave high rollers more than $2.2 billion in comp services. Officials say Nevada's gaming profits began sinking when the global economic downturn worsened at the end of 2008. Don't comp the big guys so much. <laughs> Don't comp them, they won't come. Well, that's true, too, I suppose. All right, we thank you for watching the Channel 4 News here at 5 and 5.30. But stay where you are. Chuck Henry is standing by with a look at what's new on the Channel 4 News at 6. Chuck. As you know, they've been calling it the miracle on the Hudson, and in this digital age, you just knew that somebody had to have some video of U.S. Airways Flight 1549. Someone did grab their camera and they tracked the flight just moments before it crashed into the Hudson River. We'll have that story coming up next at 6. Also, just ahead, breaking news out of Long Beach tonight, where a married couple vanished while they were cruising to Mexico. So what happened on this Carnival cruise ship? It is a big mystery, and it's our top story tonight, just three minutes away on the Channel 4 News at 6 o'clock. The inauguration of Barack Obama, all day covered with today. Brian Williams and the best of NBC News, plus a primetime special at 10, 9 central. The inauguration of Barack Obama, Tuesday on NBC. Live from NBC4, this is the Channel 4 News at 6.